Uh, good morning and welcome to our program. Today is the 6th of February. Time is moving so fast. And we thank God for giving us an opportunity to worship him through the platform. Sorry that we have to change the program due to the load shedding in some areas. But at this moment, we'd like to open our program by singing hymn number 50, saying, Abide with me. Very much. We are in a good time where we have to pray, and uh, we know that the people we seek, they are things that are not being good. So we're just going to bow down as we pray together. Let us bow as we pray. Almost kind and gracious Father, what in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this privilege of life. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to be worshiping you uh, through this platform. Lord, we thank you for still guiding us since this year 2021 has started and today we have reached the first Sabbath of February, all our life may not be glorified. At this time of the afternoon, we come before thee to seek forgiveness for our sin where we fell thee, that our prayer can be granted made in front of you, Lord. We'd like to pray for people who are not feeling good, those who have been in the hospital and some have been come out, it shows that our prayers are being answered, Lord. We'd like to pray for our family members, our church members who are not feeling good. We'd like also to commit families that have lost a loved one into your hand, Lord. You are the only one who can come to rescue your people in terms of sympathy and consulting them, Lord. At this time, we'd like to put in your hand those who are traveling and those who are 
going in different direction for your work and stay on private life, please continue to guide them during this period of difficulty. Lord, at this moment, we have so much thing that we can pray. But before we open our mouth to pray, but we know what we need and what we want, Lord. Above all, we seek that you should help us to be closer to you every day of our life, so that when you return, we might be among those who are going to welcome you for the second return. We commit Pastor Arnold Neof into your hand as going to break a bread of life. And we'd like to thank you for the healing that you've shown in the family since they've been sick with the wife. And now there's a better recovery. May your name be glorified. And as, as he speak and deliver this message, let this message transform people's life and change someone's life today. We pray this and believe in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And Did you know that after Daniel received a vision concerning the final days of this world, he was so astonished that he even got sick? He simply could not understand the vision. Actually, no one did. Daniel saw the development of the great controversy, everything the people of God would have to go through. And instead of revealing the explanation for everything, the Lord only asked him to seal up the vision because it referred to the future, to the time of the end. Centuries later, John the disciple also had a vision, but this time an angel who was holding a little book commanded him to figuratively eat it. The little book was sweet as honey in the mouth, but bitter in the stomach. The vision was predicting what would happen in 1844, as the Millerite movement found excitement in partially understanding the prophecy given to Daniel, followed by the great disappointment of not seeing Christ coming back in the clouds. Today, we understand that this was only the beginning of the Adventist movement and that 1844 was part of God's broad plan for humanity. In fact, we're all living in the time of the end, right now. But most people around the globe have no idea about this. That is why we need to reach all nations, bringing the good news to every single person living on the surface of the earth. As you return your tithe and give your promise, Think about how your faithfulness can be a blessing to those who haven't heard a word about the gospel. Pray to Jesus so you become useful in his kingdom even before the world witnesses him coming back in the clouds. May we put our desires last and God first. Yeah, thank you very much for that display. Um, just the announcement to the church uh, during the offering times, we have decided to take this platform to indicate the church because we receive calls from church members. They are wondering how are they going to return the tithe and offering. Uh, on the screen, you can take a photo of that or you can note down the banking details displayed. At the banking details of church at one big SDA church, Standard Bank. 0717728555 and the branch is Constantia. So when you want to deposit any offerings or type, you put your name as a reference and you write in front of it for type or so offering, you put your name and you write in front offering. The example shown on a pamphlet so that we can avoid confusion when the treasury is trying to please the founding. Thank you very much, and may the Lord continue to bless you as you think of retaining what does not belong to us, but what belongs to him to further up his work so that his sin return may come further. Now we jump into Kids Corner, and we have uh, Michael who's going to present it. Thank you very much, and welcome, Michael. Dear Peace Church, my name is Michael, and I'm five years old. My joke is of today is I choose to listen to God. My memory verse is Genesis 6 verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There was a man called Noah and he had three sons and he listened to God. Then, then go, people were killing and doing those naughty things. Then God, God went to Noah and said, Noah, I want you to make it up because I'm going to destroy the whole earth with water. 
then Noah was building the ark, then, then, the, then he was calling the people, come, come build the ark, God will destroy the whole earth with water. Then the people were saying, the water doesn't come from up, it, it comes from down. Then, then they were building the ark. Until the ark was finished, the pe then the, the animals came in two by two. Then, then Noah said, come people, come inside. Then the people went listening. They said, are you crazy? This man is crazy. Then they were making joke, a, a fun of him. Then the, God was, was shut the door. Then it was, it was raining. Then they said, let's go run to the house. The rain was already coming inside. Then they said, let's go run to the tree. The, the rain was already raining. Then they said, let's go run to the mountain. Then the, the, until the water was covered of water. Then after the 30, then the people died. And it, then he famine 40 days and 40 nights. Then the people died. So we will now handle over to the pastor as you briefly. I want to greet the uh, Weinberg uh, family, church family. I'm just putting my uh, PowerPoint up. Uh, Jeremy, just uh, confirm that uh, I've got the right screen, that you can see the right screen. Uh, yes, Pastor, we've got the picture of your family, but we don't see your video. All right. <clears throat> um, is it better now? Yeah, your video is off, Pastor. I'm not sure how to... Okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, no. I know what the problem is. Thank you. Yes, there you are. You're good to go. Thank you. Well, once again, um, I want to welcome you this afternoon. I hope that you are blessed and that you are safe. And uh, I need to, I just need to tell you that uh, you are constantly in my prayers and my thoughts. And uh, I thank you for all your prayers for us as, uh, as a family. Well, greetings from you from, uh, to you from Edna uh, and our four kids. And um, <clears throat> we, we can just testify of, um, of God's greatness and uh, the fact that he is a real God and that he cares about us. Um, we, we would not have been here today. I would not have spoken to you today if it wasn't for, for his grace alone. For our scripture reading, um, I invite you to read with me from Isaiah 41 verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. <clears throat> uh, 
And uh, the Lord says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let's pray before we start. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the great God of this universe and that you care about us, Lord, in such a, in such a wonderful way. Lord, the fact that we are here today, and that we are alive, that is a miracle. The fact that we <clears throat> can serve you, Lord, that is a miracle. And we want to give you all the honor and all the glory for allowing this, Lord. I thank you for, for the uh, message that you have put on our hearts today. And we ask, Lord, that you would open our minds, <clears throat> make our hearts receptive. And Lord, that we won't see the humanity in whatever will be discussed today, but we will see a straight message from you. And this is our prayer, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> our God is pressing on me to have a, a heart to heart talk with you this morning or this afternoon about the lessons I've learned in the near-death experience contracting the coronavirus in the last couple of weeks. I pray that, that I will not be seen and I will not be heard, but that God's word will echo in your, in your ears today. I've, had, I've, I've learned at least nine very important lessons to my question, where is God in my suffering? Now, <clears throat> this, this lessons have, have escalated. I started this message with, I think it was like four or five. And, and as I delved deeper and deeper with the Lord, there, there was more and more. And um, so even on my slide, you would see that I say these eight lessons I've learned and I can now tell you, I'm going to share nine lessons with you that the Lord has taught us uh, in, this, uh, in this question, where is God in my suffering? Now, the reality is our world is filled with evil and suffering. There is war. There is injustice everywhere. There is violence. There is greed that choke humanity every moment of every day. While disease and viruses, natural disasters and famine kill millions more. We all know that it's not the way it's supposed to be. A three-year-old little girl are not supposed to die of breast cancer. Families are not supposed to stop existing because of a car accident. Thousands are not supposed to die because of a microscopic virus. If there is a God, does he even care? And this is what goes through our minds at a time like this, I'm sure. And many ask, where is God? Were you ever tempted to ask the question in this past couple of months, where is God in all of this? Where are you, God, in all this evil and all this suffering? Some belief systems say evil is just an illusion. I want to tell you, no, it is not. The, the moment a child dies, and tens of thousands of which will die today, it is not an illusion. It is a nightmarish reality. Another answer we get from some belief systems is, 
maybe God has to allow evil so that we can have a choice. Well, really, people? <laughs> is, 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 is that, could that be true? So what they are telling us and trying to tell us is that God had to allow the Holocaust to occur. Otherwise, you and I could not love him freely. Now, I can't believe that that is true. And besides, it doesn't help us with the answer. We is God in our suffering. It's not an answer. So the question remains, why has God forgotten about us? Has he really forsaken us? And I want to tell you, you know, when, you, when you're so sick that you, that you don't have the strength to get up just to walk to the bathroom that's three meters from where you are, these questions become real. Has God forsaken me? Now, I'm sure you are wondering where we are going with this in this sermon. To complicate this even further, we read a quote where our prophet Tess writes in uh, Councils on Health, page 462. And, and, I'm, and I'm quoting, near the end of time, Satan will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. He imparts to the air a deadly taint. Guys, is this not really speaking about what we are experiencing? The quote goes on. And thousands perished by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. So don't think, you know, uh, we've had a COVID-19 and we've had a first wave and we have a, we've had a second wave and they, they are, you know, they are pronouncing that there will be at least a third wave still. Uh, that's not going to be the end. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. And so the reason why I'm putting emphasis on this is because if, if we are not well grounded in where is my God in these troubled times, then we will be in trouble. We will question many things. My personal faith has been challenged in the last couple of months. I must be honest with you. And especially in the last few weeks, the devastating effect of the coronavirus, especially the second wave, has not only knocked on the doors of those in our neighborhood, our church members, our friends, and our own families. It has knocked on my own door. An eye-opener has been the fact that there's no discrimination between age and gender and culture and ethnicity, living healthy principles, or even spiritual beliefs. Since I recovered from terminal cancer 24 years back, I've learned that the cause of disease is the breaking of the health laws God has given to mankind to protect him. Exodus 15 verse 26 says, and he said, if you will carefully listen to the voice of Jehovah your God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his laws, I will put none of these diseases upon you which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am Jehovah who heals you. Now, that is a powerful promise, and I've personally seen the effect of this over many years, helping people recover from lifestyle diseases like cancer and diabetes and hypertension, etc. If one will obey God's laws and statutes, one will not be plagued by these lifestyle diseases. Now, you can just imagine with that background and that belief system I have, how one's belief system is challenged when one obeys God's health laws without compromise and then still contracts COVID-19 and gets sick to the death. Where is God? 
Why did he not protect me? What did I do wrong? I followed the laws. I've been grappling with this issue for weeks now. One would expect God to protect when one does all from our side to be protected. Now, in my case, I can state that I fo I'm following an uncompromised, healthy living policy. So you can understand why I seek answers to these questions from God. And I believe that many of us might be in the same boat. The Israelites was exempted in Egypt when they had the blood of a slain lamb painted on their doorposts to protect their firstborn from death. Lord, I have your blood painted on my hard doors. Why have you not protected me? Why have the angel of disease not passed me? I've kept your statutes and your laws and your commandments. Why have thou allowed the virus to come and, and disable us for such a long time? So what I want to share with you is what I've learned from this horrific ordeal. I don't want to go into the detail of, of what we've gone through. Edna and I, you know, occasionally do, during the day, we look at each other and we just say, God has been very, very good to us. There was a time that we were very scared that we're going to die. There was a time in the last couple of weeks where we were scared we're not going to die. I heard my wife say, I can't anymore. I, ca I cannot take this anymore. I cannot bear this anymore. And I want to assure you that many of our peers is not with us anymore. It is reality. So what have we learned? Well, lesson number one. Never think or say that disease will not come your way. It is presumption to think that God will protect you because you are keeping the health laws or whatever you are doing. It is only by his grace that he ordered the angel of death to pass the door painted with blood. It's only his grace that can protect you from disease and disaster and suffering. Satan is real. And he will exercise his destructive powers to destroy, especially those that have pledged their loyalty to the, to the creator God. So don't think that disease will never come your way. And I've heard people say this. I've heard people say, you know, this thing won't touch me because I'm following the health laws. Well, people, I am the witness there. It does not work that way. Lesson number two. Don't listen to what the devil wants you to believe. When the devil starts stirring with questions like, so you have sacrificed appetite, but what did it help you? You have lived by biblical health principles. It did not protect you. You got sick like all those around you that has lived without giving attention to any health laws. It's an illusion. He wants you to think that way. He whispers in your ear, where's your God now? While you're sick and it feels like you might die, your God cannot really protect you in the way you might think. It's all an illusion. And I want to tell you, when you're sick and you've got fever and you've got pain that I cannot explain, this direct confrontation with the enemy gets to thinking even deeper and deeper. So where is God really during the pandemic? Where were God with those gruesome car and truck accidents in the last few weeks? You know, I've never been too um, 
uh, actively looking at all the news, but I, you know, I had more time to look at the news and things. And I saw these tragic things happening. Where is God in our suffering? When we get thrown in the fire of affliction, where is he? Today, we just need to get the first question answered while we are suffering. And our enemy is, he's tormenting us with lots of distractions, getting us on different directions. Now, we're not going to even attempt in the little few minutes that we have left to, to answer the whys. No. We just need to know, where are you, Lord, while it feels as if the world has come to an end for me? Now, the Lord directs my thoughts to his servants, Sajak, Meshach, and Abednego. They were faithful servants of the Lord in enemy territory. By the way, beloved, I want to remind you, we need to keep in mind we are in enemy territory. This is not our home. This is not our home. They were standing out for their faith in the living God of Israel. They were praying daily for, for, for his protection and his guidance. How could God allow his servants to be thrown in a fiery furnace? Where was he at that moment? We need to get to the answer from the Holy Scriptures this morning. And you, you, you know the background. We've got it all here in this, in this wonderful book. Nebuchadnezzar, and I'm putting this in short in a, in a nutshell. He was full of himself. And he makes an image of gold that he has seen in his dream to make a statement that he is the greatest on the earth and he will last forever. All that they had to do, all his servants, all the people around, they had to bow before this image. If not, they will be thrown in a fiery furnace. Now, Daniel 3 verse 15 and onward tells us about this horrific event. Verse 15 says, King Nebuchadnezzar says, but if you do not worship in that moment, you shall be thrown in the middle of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God who shall? The 16 and 17 says, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to return a word to you on this matter. If it is so that our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, then he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Now, verse 19, look at this. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath. He got very angry. And the form of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and he commanded that they should heat that furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Then we go to verse 20. And he commanded mighty men in his army to tie up Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and to throw them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were tied up in their slippers, their tunics, their mantles and the other clothes. And they were thrown into the middle of the burning furnace. Fury furnace. Verse 22 says, and then because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So those that threw them in, they killed in, they were killed instantly when they threw them in. 23, verse 23, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell down bound into the midst of the burning. Fury furnace. Then we go to verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was amazed. He rose up in haste and he spoke and he said to his advisors, Did we not throw three men bound into the middle of the fire? 
And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. Yes, we did. Verse 25, he answered and he said, but behold, I see four loose walking in the middle of the fire and there's no harm among them. And the form of the fourth is like a son of God. And then 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. And he answered and he said, he was actually calling Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God, come forth, come here. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth from the middle of the fire. And what do we see? Yeah, this, is a, this is a biblical narrative. It, it's actually too good to be true. Not so, my brother, my sister. Just imagine, thrown in a fiery furnace, and you walk out, and the Bible says, and you can go and look at those verses. I'm not going to share it with you now because of time. But they walked out there with not the smell of fire on them. There was not a, a hair that was scorched. They closed. There was nothing wrong with it. It was only those things that bound them that were burnt off. The question remains, where was God when his servants were sentenced to death and thrown into the fiery furnace? How could he have allowed that? Because we've got this thought, and, and I must be honest with you, you know, I've had this thought, God will protect me. The reality is, did he forsake them, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, when he allowed King Nebuchadnezzar to throw them into the fire? Now, initially, it seems that way, doesn't it? But listen to this promise in Isaiah 43, verse 2. Isaiah 43, verse 2 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burnt, nor shall the flame kindle on you. He did not promise you will not experience flood of water or that you will protect you from he will protect you from getting into the fire. No, he promised that if you get into that position, he will be with you there in the midst of that suffering. Where was my God when I was sick to death? He was right with me. He was right next to me. He was right there where I am. When my family and I were exposed to the coronavirus and got very sick, where was God? Did he ever promise us you will not get sick? No, he did not promise that. Does it mean that he cannot protect us from a microscopic virus? No, he can. Where is God in times like these? It's so important to sort this out in your own mind today, my brother, my sister, because there is more things to come. There is more tragedies that is going to follow. We are going to suffer more. It's not going to get better. Now, some immediately react and they say, but pastor, how can you ask a question, where is God? What do you believe? I need to give you a gentle reminder. This is what the devil whispers in your ears while you are sick, while you suffer from financial losses, while you suffer from accidents, while you suffer from whatever things are happening in your life. But the fact is, Jesus asked the same question while he was compromised. While he was being executed on a Roman cross, he asked the question. In agony, he cried out to his father. He said, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Remember the words, Eli, Eli, Lama Samachthani. It was interpreted, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And this is how it feels when you are you can feel your strength just drained 
and there's no life in you anymore. You're so sick. Now, why does all this even matter? Because this Jesus that cried out. And I remember, he was not just a man. He was God. Yet suffering in agony on the cross, he cried out as evil itself closed in. And God the Son, the eternally sinless one, bore all of the sins of all of human history on himself. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, he said, and uh, let me read the words, he says, humans could never be friends with a God because friends have things in common. Friends can look at each other and say, you too? In Jesus, God entered into our human condition. He shared in our sufferings. He was condemned by his own creatures. And I, I believe Aristotle was right. Humans can never be friends with a God that they have nothing in common with. The fact is, my God is in the suffering with me. Can you see? There is something in common. We can look at Jesus and say, Jesus, you are here with us in the fire. This is what Sajak Mesh, Mishik and Abednego said. Now, I apologize for the following example. Because this is long past history that was very hurtful. But I know we have to hit the mark today with something we are all battling with. In this life suffering. There was a man named. Eli Wiesel. He survived Hitler's death camps. And later went on to write about this experience. And he recalls an event. In one of his books. The hanging of a young boy. That the Nazis forced. The entire camp to watch. And this boy was so small. That his weight of his body wouldn't break his neck. And so he hung there suffering for hours. The writer said, I heard a man behind me cry out, where is God? And as they stood there and they watched the boy suffer, he said, I heard him again. Where is God now? And he said, a voice rise within me to answer him. And it said this. He is here with us on these gallows. Christian hope is not about some God in the sky speaking words of comfort to us while we suffer. No, our hope is in the word who became flesh and lived and suffered among us. That's the difference between Jesus and everything else you would hear everybody else talking about. He understands your suffering. He understands your pain. He understands your, the injustices. He understands the evil. And evil is everywhere. And it's never been more clear than on the cross of Jesus where God himself became its willing victim for us. So what's the answer? Where is God while we experience so much evil and suffering in this world? Where was God while Edna and I fought for our lives in the last few weeks? God is giving you something better than an verbal answer today. He has given himself to you. And still better, the sovereign and uh, resurrected Jesus tells us that evil does not get the final word. He does. We read in Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. 
he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Jesus was bruised for our iniquities. He is in the suffering with us. Is there more examples? I had more time to read in the last few weeks. And I found some wonderful encouragement from Ellen White that helped me and to, to sustain in these difficult times. Ellen White never got discouraged. Even in the presence of disease. And I must say, you know, that's where I felt very weak because I got very discouraged. She kept fighting for a family and the brethren she was able to help as she clung to, to the Lord's promises. We must also proclaim that trust in the protective power of God in the midst of our crisis are going to help us to get through. So what are some of the other lessons that I've learned from this horrific ordeal? Lesson number three, do not get discouraged. This is not an easy one. And I know it. I'm speaking from personal experience. We need to apply practically certain actions that could be challenging when one is very sick and weak. What is a lesson to be learned to dispel discouragement? Well, it brings me to lesson number four. Cling to our Lord's promises. We must remember that God's presence gives us courage. And the lesson is to cling to our Lord's promises. Read those promises over and over, knowing, fear not, for I am with you. So even though you are here in pain and you are having such a high fever and your brain is getting foggy and you cannot connect, Fear not, for I am with you. In the words of Apostle Paul, we find in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8 and 9, and I'm so encouraged by this. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. It is a situation that has struck, but not destroyed us. We are facing struggles. We are facing difficult trials and more challenging situations will come. But Jesus is alive. He is our refuge. He is our strength. And even if we go through the valley of the shadow of death, you should, we should not be afraid. Because his staff and his rod comforts us. That's what Psalms 23 says. And then Ellen White, in the lesson number five, I've learned, don't stop fulfilling your calling. Ellen White did not stop working in her home. She set up a time to meet her goals. She says she never stopped writing a daily quota. And this is something useful to do because it reinforces our sense of mission. We must not lose our focus. We must look for a way of meeting our goals even during lockdown, even during sickness. Because we are isolated, but not in silence. We have a mission to fulfill in the context of mission. Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 20, he said, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I will be with you. Keep on. Keep on sharing the message. Now, there's a lesson number six I've learned. And that is to keep active with the right attitude. Ellen White had the privilege of um, 
and 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 I, and I want to just I want to just put this in your mind. If Ellen White had the privilege of using social media as we have today, I'm sure she would have kept in touch with the church, encouraging members, giving them hope through current communication channels. I imagine her creating perhaps a small group online, a special message to the church through social media, morning advice for her Facebook followers, a pre-recorded devotional message shared through social media. Do not get discouraged. We have a lot to do. And there's a lot that we can do with just a little bit of creativity. I've recently read phrases such as, churches are open. It's only buildings that are closed. The church is open because the church is you and the church is me. We are opening our digital church. You can follow church worship services on the internet. And many have used Zoom like we're doing right now. And other video conferencing software as means of connecting with others. There's another lesson that I've learned. Lesson number seven. Lesson number seven says, acquire a prayerful attitude. Ellen White had a prayerful attitude full of trust in God's power in moments like these. We must trust the wonderful promise that God left for us in the Holy Word. We have thousands of promises to cling to. Pray on these promises. She wrote, she said, I thank the Lord I am improving and I'm of good courage. The church must cling to Jesus more firmly than ever. When Paul was being taken to Rome, as a prisoner, and he had to face a dreadful storm at sea, and his ship endured strong winds called the um, the the Euroclidon. At that moment, he said three specific things. You can look at it in Acts twenty-seven, verse twenty-three to twenty-five. Do not be afraid. Do not get discouraged. Be hopeful. Keep a positive attitude. There will be no losses because God will be with you. So lesson number eight, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. This takes us right back to our scripture reading of this morning. Isaiah 41 verse 10, it says, fear not for I am with you. I think this is one of the biggest problems with this whole pandemic is that there is such a lot of fear that is blown into our minds by what's happening. And I want to tell you, we need not to fear because God is in control. What a promise. Lesson number nine. Lesson number nine. Use the means and the remedies God has provided. It is not a lack of faith that he will protect me if I go now and look at remedies to help me through this. Edna and I had to go to the old remedies of steaming. We had to do hydrotherapies. We had to go and use supplements that we don't normally use. We had to go to the point where we used medicines to get us back on track. It is not a lack of faith when we do these things. This is unfortunately what these pandemics is calling for. Now in summary, what have I learned from this near death experience in the last couple of weeks? I've learned the following eight things. Don't think disease will never come to you your way. Don't listen to what the devil wants you to believe. Do not get discouraged. Cling to our Lord's promises. Don't stop fulfilling your calling. Keep active with the right attitude. Acquire a prayerful attitude. Do not be afraid. Use the means that and the remedies that God has provided. 
those are the nine lessons. And I tell you what, every day I learn more. I would probably share more in the future. So what have you learned? Where is Jesus while you suffer? I want to encourage you as we sing the last song. You could in the chat just put there, what have you learned from this experience that I've shared with you today? May the Lord help you and me to get stronger, to meet these challenges that we have now seen in the prophetic word will be there again. And it will be more intense and it will be more disastrous as time goes on. And we can just thank the Lord that we are living in these exciting times. I want to pray for you. I want to ask that the Lord will help you to take the lessons that I've learned and start applying it in your life with the suffering that you have and the things that you can't get over. This is just a simple answer to where is God in my suffering? We've not tried to answer why. And maybe in the, in the, in the future, we'll talk about why does God allow this? Why is he allowing Sadrach, Meshach, Abednego? Why did he allow them to actually drop into that fire? He could have stopped them before. Why did he allow me and Edna and our family to get very sick? Why? And may the Lord help us to answer those questions in the future. Let's pray. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are such a great, kind, merciful God. Lord, we don't have all the answers for all the challenges that we experience in this life. But we know, Lord, that you care about us. We know that you love us. We know, Lord, that even in the suffering, although Satan here in the background is trying to make us believe some illusion, we know that you are with us. That you are not far distant somewhere along the way somewhere. You are here with us. Thank you, Lord, that I can leave each one of my brothers and my sisters that I, that I so dearly love in your care today. Thank you, Lord, for, for sustaining those that have lost loved ones in this pandemic. Thank you, Lord, for those lives that you've saved in this pandemic. Thank you, Lord, for the protection that we can have from you we give you the honor and the glory for that. Thank you, Lord, that our prayer today, that you would sustain us to the end, is heard by a living God that cares and loves us. Thank you, Lord, for what you are doing for us. Thank you for abiding with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you very much, Pastor. We will now close our service. Um, the message will be led close with him number 99. God will take care of you.
let's ask God to just uh, bless us before we, uh, we part. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that you could have spent with us today. Thank you that you gave us the strength to be here. Thank you, Lord, that we can now, I can leave each one in your loving care. I pray that the grace of our Father and the love of Jesus and the ever presence of his Spirit will be with us until we meet, Lord. Keep us safe. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of thy throne, still may we dwell secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defense is sure. in order stood or earth received her frame from everlasting thou art God to endless years the same a thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun oh god our help in ages past our hope for years to be thou our guide while life shall last and our eternal